though it seems like it would be. But a hydraulic rock splitter, oh boy, that would be cool. Sure, yeah. So I'm going to mix two questions together. Great idea. <laughs> like a question sandwich. And then for Coralie, who's busy, so we will come back. Oh, the light question. Does the light uh, harm the animals that we come across because they don't have any exposure to light before we pop into their world? Yeah, this is a, a common question we get, and um, we don't believe that the light actually harms the animals, um, but some animals uh, might react to the light in the same way you might react to someone shining a flashlight in your eyes. So it could be uncomfortable, um, might blind you for a little bit, but after a little while, your eyes will recover. So no, no real damage done. But a lot of these animals don't have eyes, so they're not going to be uh, reacting to the, the light of the ROV, but they might react to the vibration and the sound uh, that the ROV makes. Are fish more or less common in areas with high coral sponge density? Coral slash sponge density. That would be a really, I think, interesting thing to study. So uh, yeah, we usually do see more fishes in areas where you're seeing a lot of corals, but it can also be hard to spot the fish if there's a lot of high density corals, just because there's so much other things to look at. Uh, but do fish do use uh, corals as refugia, so they will use it as a, a place to, to hide and uh, as habitat. I think I'm spotting a flying sea cucumber in the uh, Argus cam. I've never heard the word refugia before. Yeah, that was nice. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, what's our bearing? 120, thank you. Yeah, I've been spotting some really fun stuff in Argus cam, so, so don't forget to check out Argus. Argus definitely has a nice eye in the sky view, shows us some really neat stuff. And that's on satellite feed too. Or if you're looking at the quad, it's the one in the top right. Coralie, you good? You ready? Yep. All right. Uh, what is the interest in geological sample collection and why are we uh, collecting water pair? Okay. Uh, so I think they mean my geological sample collection yes. and not just geological sample collection in general. Correct. But, um, so we're specifically looking at ferromanganese crust. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, for my uh, research, is figure out uh, what controls the enrichments of ferromanganese crust. Because they are very enriched in metals, um, of economic importance, like cobalt, nickel, manganese. And um, so one of the ways I'm trying to do that is by looking at water, because these rocks precipitate out of the water. Oh. So, sorry, I'm getting really, I'm trying to take pictures of this cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time as... So if I, okay, I'll, I'll interrupt your, your yeah, monologue yeah, for the go. sea cucumber ID. Um, this is an Ipniastes that we're spotting in the Argus cam. And uh, it's kind of funny because Argus sort of bobs up and down. That's sort of, that's the surface of the water uh, motion of the ocean, as you might say, uh, coming through down through Argus. So we can't keep still, uh, but Argus helps Hercules have free reign on its tether. So. That's why it's bobbing up and down a little bit. We're feeling some bobbing on the surface, and we're seeing it here down deep through Argus. And that's why that sea cucumber kept coming in and out of view, <laughs> getting closer and closer. <laughs> 
All right, Coralie, take it away with our rocks. Oh uh, yeah, I forgot my place. I think that I think I explained it though. We're <laughs> looking looking at the water to help understand what makes the rock. Yeah. It did good. But if you want to know why we collect geological samples, geology is the study of rocks, and rocks is what makes up Earth. That's like our baseline, and or at least the Earth that we can see. And so studying rocks tells us a lot about how Earth formed over its four billion year history. Awesome, awesome. So we're basically, basically through these questions, actually. Um, yeah, how much do we know about the reproductive situation of the fish at these depths? We're just checking in on the front row, making sure they're having a good time up there. All right, what was the question? Uh, how much do we know about the reproductive situation of the fish at these depths? Um, well, we don't really know that much. Um, we've just sort of started scratching the surface of identifying these animals. So um, we did have dredge or uh, net toes that have collected some of these animals. Uh, but a lot of these animals, this is the first time or, you know, only they've only been seen alive a handful of times. So we, we don't really know that much about what they do to reproduce and how they find each other. But uh, there probably is some sort of signaling that the animals give off. That's what a lot of animals do when they are ready to reproduce. They will signal and finding your partner in the deep sea can be challenging. So there are some adaptations uh, that have arisen to thwart this challenge. Um, one of the more famous ones is that Midwater anglerfish, having uh, the female is relatively large and the male is very small. And when the male finds a female, he attaches to her so that they are always together. That way, when she is ready to reproduce, um, she has the material to do so. Uh, but not all animals do that. Um, sometimes when you see large aggreg aggregations of animals, that might mean that that there's a spawning time or a mating time occurring and they come together for that purpose. But there's a lot of work to be done in reproduction in the deep sea, which is pretty difficult to study just because of we don't know when this is happening. Um, so trying to find the time when it's happening and being there for it can be a, a challenge. We're not always on the ocean floor looking at what's around. Um, ooh, questions about the peanut butter rocks. Um, they're wondering if a rock just being underwater for millions of years just kind of dissolves into this peanut butter-like consistency, structure, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Or what? what's the deal with that? How does that form? Yeah, that substrate looks super crumbly. Um, I have seen that before. Uh, so normally these rocks form on volcanic rocks. Um, I think it would be a little bit weird for a volcanic rock to get that crumbly, but I don't know, it might be possible. Um, but that will happen from alteration. And thus, last for now, substrate question. Um, is the sand at these depths any different than the sand on the beach or is this even sand? Uh, I would, I think it's probably different than the sand on the beach. This probably is like a mix of marine snow and some dust. The sand on the beach, depending on where you are, is white sand beaches are quartz. 
um, so it's glass. And uh, green sand beaches, though, we were talking about that. You can see a green sand beach on um, on the big island. That's super cool. What's green sand made of? It's made of olivine, which is this really cool mineral, and it only can form um, in the Earth's mantle. That's the only place it can form. That's super It's not cool. stable on, like outside of Earth's crust. So how you get Green Sand Beach is you like form this olivine underneath and somehow something brings it up, like magma or something will bring it up to the surface. That's the only way we can see olivine at the surface. So it's pretty cool to have a Green Sand Beach. Absolutely. You said it's on, there's some on the big island? Yeah. Ooh. And uh, is, oh, I actually had this question a couple dives ago. Um, is there interest in uh, drawing Manganese crust on artificial surfaces to reduce the stress on mining and deep water environments. Um, so how ferromanganese, mm -hmm. so artificial surfaces, like what, like, well, a, like, you know, recreating this in a lab, basically. Um, well, you need, you need the water, you need the cobalt and like the nickel and you need all the dissolved ions in the water to make the crust. So you'd need to get to make it in the lab. So if what you're wanting to get is the cobalt, right. you, you would, would need, need to get it. the cobalt to put in the water to make the crust. Yeah. <laughs> to get the cobalt Not out of the, the water. Best, uh, kind of a loop of a, a downward spiral. Yeah. We, uh, you know, right now it's actually not economically, like the cost benefit analysis of mining right now doesn't really make sense because it is cheaper to buy it on land. So... Really, the only problem with using cobalt is the humanitarian issue. Mm. You know, just think about all of the children who can't go to school. So we can use cell phones. Yep. <laughs> if it was reasonably feasible, would a stationary deep sea research base be more or less useful than mobile research platforms like ROVs? Well, the point of using an ROV is that we don't have to have humans underwater because humans like need things like food and bathroom breaks and air, and uh, ROVs don't need any of that, so they can stay underwater for as long as we would like them to. Also, ROVs can explore; they they move. They move. Yeah, we would have to get in like suits or something in order to explore around, right? Yeah. Or like manned submarines, which w the, there used to be, I mean, there still are manned submarines, like if we want to go in them, but it's just not as efficient uh, as uh, sending an ROV down. Yeah, manned submarines like the Alvin, they can usually, they usually only stay down for about eight hours uh, because you put three people in a sphere that's about seven feet across. That's it's a very cramped space to, to be in for long periods of time. Yeah, how long do they go down for? They usually only go down for eight hours. So it's like eight, how, it's like two hour descent and then like... It depends on how deep you're going. Like, oh, okay. But that's eight total, including descent and ascent, right? or is it? Right, like yeah. eight total. I mean, I guess you could extend it, but it would be very difficult on the people in the sub. Mm -hmm. um, the sub, I believe, has... Uh, at least a week worth of air and food, just in case. But um, that would not be an ideal situation to be in. Because yeah. where do you use the bathroom? Yeah, yeah. so right, the bathroom situation is, is non-existent, really. Stock, I mean. yeah. yeah. They do bring um, containers for emergencies, but... Yeah, my advisor went on, she actually went down in the Alvin and um, she stopped eating and drinking before, so mm -hmm. she wouldn't need to use the bathroom ever. Yeah, I've been down in the, the Pisces subs. Ooh. They're similar to Elvin, and um, yeah, I definitely, I, I would have a very light breakfast and not eat anything, um, and then have an extremely light lunch when we were in the sub, so it would be an apple, um, nuts, nothing too heavy because You've got to be in there all day. And then upon recovery at about 4 o'clock, just wait for dinner pretty much at that point. And then have a nice big dinner. And 
Drink some water. Yeah, I feel like no matter what, even if I hadn't like had anything to drink or eat in like a day, I would still, as, as soon as I stepped in, like feel the need to pee. I feel like I would have to pee the whole time. Oh man, the, the end of the dive was definitely more challenging. Uh, like I was so <laughs> excited about being down there, but uh, recovery, um, I was definitely pretty much ready to bolt for the head after that. So uh, people were asking me like, oh, how was it? I'm like, I'll tell you in a moment. <laughs> Um, and uh, last thing from way back, uh, they were saying if you want to go south, you know, come to New Zealand. I would love to come to New Zealand and hang out and look at stars. So, like, that's an invitation. Is the is the New yeah. Zealand comet Moya? What is the New Zealand comet from Moya? Yeah. Hi, Hi Moira. <laughs> Who's Moira? Moira. Moira was a regular. Oh. Yeah, I do know someone in New Zealand, but you know. I'll go as many times as I'm as many times as I'm invited. Yeah, New Zealand's definitely on my list of places to visit. Same. Um, oh, the idea of uh, the artificially replicating the crust. They were thinking of like an underwater like farm. So you like put down artificial things, uh, but it takes a little while though, right, to form these crusts. Yeah. So it takes these crusts have been forming to form a crust. It takes on the scale of like a million years to get one to ten millimeters of crust. Is there any way to accelerate that, do you think? Uh, maybe. I think if you had enough cobalt. So one is like you need to grow the manganese and uh, oxides and ferromanganese or iron oxyhydroxides and then you need them to be able to sequester metals out and to do that um, I think chemical reactions, like the speed, I'm not quite sure about the speed. There's like functions that dictate that, but you always need enough. Um, I don't know. This is like chemistry. You need enough uh, reactants mm -hmm. always to make the reaction happen and it stops happening when you don't have enough of a reactant. So you would need an abundance of the cobalt and nickel and stuff you need like more than like probably is in the ocean column at one time so same problem different location basically I, yeah i don't think uh i don't think making these artificially is going to solve the problem unfortunately i think if people wanted to solve the problem people could look into recycling metals so we only recycle like five percent of our metals so be a good place to start mm -hmm. yeah we do have material we don't necessarily need to mine for it it's there ready in our hands Ooh, yeah to recycle um the ooh was not for that sorry <laughs> um but because you're both here not all watches have a marine biologist and a geologist so this watch is pretty unique that we can talk to both of you guys um this I guess that's true yeah mm -hmm. no we're, we're the coolest we're watch <laughs> <laughs> um this person wants to study both geology and marine biology once they enter college. Um, until they started watching the streams, they uh, thought that the two subjects were mostly separate, although now they're learning that they are rather intertwined and they could possibly study both simultaneously. Could you study both simultaneously? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have a friend who did a double major in marine biology and marine geology, uh, and then she recently got her PhD a couple years ago, um, focusing on geology, because found that she really enjoyed the geological aspect uh, more. But yeah, you can definitely study both. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, double majored in geology and anthropology, which isn't exactly the same, but there, she would go into, she did kind of like bio things. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, now she's a TikTok manager. A for effort. Yeah. <laughs> but what's a TikTok you know, if you, manager? If you are, I don't. I don't know what uh, a TikTok but manager she, is. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of feedback, especially if you are looking into marine sciences. There's a lot of feedback between a lot of different things. So if you wanted to go into something like oceanography, there's a bunch of different focuses that really interplay within each other so just within oceanography there's biological geological 
physical and chemical. Yeah, and even though you might specialize in one aspect, um, you're going to have to learn a little bit about each one of those aspects of marine science. So ideally, um, you would get a degree in marine science, meaning that you have uh, a wide knowledge. So mostly my, my undergrad experience had a little bit of a focus in biology, but I went to Agri College in Florida and they really stressed that we learn marine science. So not just this is biology, but also learn about the geology, the chemistry, the physical oceanography, because all of those aspects of the marine environment impact the biology. Uh, if you just study, oh, here is a nice sponge, you're not going to know um, why that sponge is there. What's it living on? <laughs> How did it get there? What's it feeding on? How do the currents work? Uh, all of that stuff combines to make it possible to have marine life. Yeah. And then you can get crazy words like, I study geochemistry, which I feel like I don't really know that much about chemistry, <laughs> clearly. Um, but because I feel like geochemistry is just geology that's exploiting chemistry to figure out something about geology. Um, but so you're already combining two words, but then you can get biogeochemistry, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is combining bio into that Biology too. is making geology yeah. chemically. Yeah. <laughs> It's like exploiting like geochemistry tools to figure out something about bio. <laughs> so there's a lot of interplay between um, at least definitely bio and geo. So yeah. And then you could also, if you wanted to study, if you know like, oh, I want to go into like a PhD, you could study something that's specifically like biogeochemistry <laughs> from the beginning. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of options, and there are so many interesting things to learn and study uh, in the ocean. And what we're doing right now is just a small fraction of what there is to learn and see and do. So this is definitely, if you are interested in going into marine science, um, take some time to explore all sorts of different fish. things so that you can find what you like shrink. the most. I'm sorry. <sighs> yeah. I saw the shadow. And if you uh, take classes at a community college, like your like math and like just general math, chemistry, like those t sorts of things, then when you get to your like secondary university or I don't know, it's not like what if you're going to a four-year university or if you're going to transfer, like you have more um, ability to take a lot of different classes there, which is also nice. I think this is a good point to point out our team's page where you can look at other people's profiles, all the different team members' profiles. And if there's a job on board that you're interested in, check out the people who are in that job. And it has their whole background, their whole education, everything there. So that's a really good place to start if you're interested in one of the careers here. There's also a quiz that I honestly cannot find without going to social media and like working through the back way. But it's somewhere on our website. And it uh, shows like what career you might be best suited to at sea. I don't think I've ever seen that quiz. It, it exists. I actually yeah. took it, but I cannot find it without going on social media first. What was yeah. your result? I was gonna say, uh, what was your career? Nothing, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can we zoom on this little guy, please? Oh, the two oh, white things are gone. Little, oh, little visitors. Go ahead. Little right. sea lily. Yep, we got a sea lily. This is a hyocrinidae. A and micro urchin? I th uh, that is a uh, an enemy. Oh, is it really? Yeah. That's sand. Is that oh. A oh. oh, it's closing. It's like, oh. It's so oh okay, tiny. I can't drive today. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, we have the official invite to New Zealand. Um, can we change the uh, the uh, cruise plan? Yeah, the cruise plan. Is that cool, Aaron? That, that's you, a uh, long steam. <laughs> <laughs> I was in New Zealand in 2019. It's beautiful, huh? beautiful country. Nice. Amazing. What Friendly part? people, and I was mainly on the South Island. Cool. Oh, Went all so around jealous. there. Wish it was me. My friend lives in the north on a farm. She's like, oh, it's just a small farm. I was like, oh, what do you farm? It's like, um, pine trees and cattle. 
So how is that a small? It's it's ginormous. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like seventy two hectares. It's a monster. It's beautiful. Uh. Ooh, a question about sea lice. That's very specific. Mm. What has been the most unique and unexpected sea lice encounter on these missions? So by sea lice, I'm assuming you're talking about amphipods. Um. I thought they meant lice that goes through like the whole cruise. Oh like, god! <laughs> oh yeah, that would be the worst. That would be the worst. <laughs> we we don't want any of that on the boat. Uh, but no, we're going to talk about amphipods at the bottom of the ocean. That's a much safer topic. Um, so one of my favorite ones uh, are the the little amphipods that build their own little sticks and then they hang out on their sticks together. It's really adorable. What are the sticks made out of? Uh, I'm not sure. They they must build them out of some sort of material they find around them. Okay, I didn't know if it was like a secretion or if they were just like gathering things. Yeah, it, it, I'm not sure. Uh, they're very thin, Aww. little like tubes, and then they stand on them. Aww, like all in a group? Yeah, like buddies. usually about two of them hang out together on a stick. I like it. Uh, there's a picture of them doing that in our animal guide. Uh, to get there, uh, go to the tab called, well, this is not the uh, Nautilus Animal Guide, but the um, OER Animal Guide. So that is on the NOAA website. What does OER Ocean stand e for? Um, Ocean Exploration Research. So you can find that at oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. Um, if you go to Arthropoda and then down to Arthropods Other, that's where you're going to find some really wacky wild um, crustaceans and arthropods. And you'll see the little amphipods hanging out on their sticks. Uh, they don't always hang out on sticks they make. Um, You'll see amphipods hanging out on other types of sticks. They like sticks for some reason. It gets them up off the seafloor. They like to hang out on them. But there's a really cute picture of a pair hanging out on their their amphipod-made stick. Uh, as a fan of all things alien, deep sea, and outer space, if we had the chance to explore the ocean on Europa, would we travel through space to discover what could be under the ice there? I personally do not want to make that trek, like with my body in that <laughs> in that uh, shuttle. But like, I would be down to like do a remote uh, research of that. Yeah. I wonder how long it takes the like speed of light to get there. Oh, I could well, not find that long. Out. to get to Europa, probably. If we move, if you're moving at the speed of light, it's gonna be like minutes. I think it's eight minutes to for light to get from the sun to here. Yeah. So from here That's to Jupiter. I don't think Mars double. is 15 minutes one way. Yeah. So it says uh, light from the sun takes about 45 minutes to reach Europa. So sun. 45 minus 8. Well, actually, I guess it depends on whether what where Earth was on like in comparison to the sun and Jupiter. So never mind. Yeah, but like, you know, if you if it was a 45 minute trip, yeah, absolutely I'd go. Uh, if it's going to be like a year to get there and get back, I uh, might reconsider. It sounds like a long time. What would traveling 45 minutes at light speed do to you, though? <laughs> I was more thinking of, know. you know, robotics, but... Robotics oh, yes, at light speed, right, yeah. true. Because <laughs> I was about to do my phone a friend and see. <laughs> well, I mean, if it was 45 minutes for the robot to get to Europa, that's faster than us getting to the no. bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I need the communications. Guys, come on. And that is why <laughs> we have explored more and we know more about space than we do about sea. <laughs> Which is sad. I wish that we need to do much more uh, deep sea exploration, which is why we're here. How much of Mars's surface is mapped to 100 meter resolution? Ooh. That's a good question. Like okay, I took the quiz it? three times. Oh, you found it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I got three different things. Wait, hang on. Did you find it on social media, though? No, I found. I just searched it. Oh, okay, cool. 
I just searched like Quiz Nautilus. The oh, first time Google. I did it, okay, I yeah. got scientist. The second time I did it, I got video engineer. And then the third time I did it, I got expedition leader. Wait, but why were you answering different every time? I w I like was like, but well, what if I like if I had two different answers and only oh, yeah, lets you yeah. choose one? So I was like, what if I chose different answers the next time? Oh yeah, surface. I of thought Mars. the third time though I would get scientist again, so I don't know why. I thought I chose the same <laughs> <laughs> answers as when I first did it. So. All right, now I'm gonna try the quiz. It means that you have diverse interests, and that's great. <laughs> it says that nearly 90% of Mars's surface has has been mapped by high-resolution stereo camera. Wow. Just for and what percent of the ocean are we at now? Like 20, 20 ish percent. Actually, Aaron, how you'd be the one to we, talk about like, this. Wait, how much have we mapped? Or how much have we explored, though? Mapped. It's different. High resolution. Uh, Aaron, you'd yeah, be the one to talk about Yeah, 20% is the estimate that they use. Yeah. The right number. You got it. That's wild. How much is it that's been explored? Oh, it has uh, to be this it's teeny like it has to be less so than small. like 15%. I think it's even less than Yeah, what, did, what did you say? 15 less is than a little 15%. high. That seems really high cuz we I, I mean like we're on a a postage stamp right now. Yeah, I don't know. When I was writing my report, I like found this like NOAA thing and it was like more than 85% of our ocean is unexplored, so I'm saying less than 15%. I wonder if what they're counting as explored, yeah, because yeah. I don't, I don't think that. I just can't imagine. Um, if you're talking eyes oh, on bottom, fish. oh, let's do this first. Hello, fish. Hello, Ooh. large fish. Hello, fish. Oh, okay. oh, oh that's Bye, fish. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get to see its face. That's a bit odd that he didn't that notice us till now. <laughs> well, it was definitely Cuskill. Without great sighted sources, uh, internet says like five to seven percent explored. Yeah, again, it depends on what you count as explored. If it's eyes on bottom, then it's going to be oh, what's decimals that? of a yeah, percent. Yeah, there's nothing. Zoom in there, please. Uh, looks like we got a cucumber. Is it a sea pig? This is one of those sea pigs. Oh, this yeah, the like weird one that we saw earlier. It's our OC mount. Yeah. Everything's weird. This is an inflatable glove. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the one okay. on the... Come wide. Yep. I like that we can see as the lens size. Whistle. So the sea pig is in the family Elpidiidae, and I think it might be a penny agony, uh, what we've been calling penny agony tulip. Um, this is, it's actually on Wikipedia as tulip. That's why it's got a name like that. Uh, I guess someone thought it looks like a tulip. I, I don't really see it, but... No, oh, somebody did the, the good work. NautilusLive.org to education, educational resources, activity, or mini lesson is where the quiz is. That makes total sense. I feel like the biology that we're seeing is like kind of different than the other biology we've seen on CMAP. Totally. CMAT. And when I was talking to Steve at dinner, he was saying that like these deep sea ecosystems are kind of interesting because um, we're only scaling up one transect and they're kind of like mosaics. So we're really only looking at one piece of the mosaic and to kind of get the full picture, like we'll go to one place, but if we went to like the other side of the seamount, it could be a completely different assemblage, you know? Agreed. Zoom in the coral. Here's another uh, Rumilla gorgia militaris, chrysogorgic coral. Dead spot down here. Oop. Coralie, you talked about this pretty extensively earlier, but you can maybe give us an overview. Um, it says, does the organization ever need to uh, gain permission from foreign governments in order to do exploration in their oceans? Can, wait, can you repeat the question? 
Do we ever need permission from foreign governments to like operate in their waters, basically? Do we need permission from other governments to operate in their waters? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know you talked about it extensively. Like, like some like overview. Uh, some people. So there's like freedom of there. Like it's hard to describe cause without going too much into like boring detail, I guess. But Ish. there's like different countries wanted different things. Like countries with really big navies want it want freedom of the seas, whereas countries um, that are more developing wanted to have access to their resources and wanted more control. Mm -hmm. So there's this like thing called He's long gone. Uh, innocent passage. So like we're allowed to like go through people's EEZs and stuff like that and innocently pass, but you know taking their resources like that's their those are their their resources, um, and so if you want to do anything like Marine scientific research, if you wanted to mine, do any Sponge. of that, you need the permission of their government first. Ooh. All right, we've got a nice sponge. Is it on the stock? I'll let you know in moments. You can zoom if you s as you see fit. It looks like it's a vase. I'm looking really far down into this sponge. I think it's a traffic cone. Traffic <laughs> cone? Ups inverted traffic cone? <laughs> Is that a stock or is it just a skinnier sponge? I, I think it's just getting skinnier. Cool. That's pretty. That's really cool. That's nice. Um, I'm debating if or not we should collect it. Do we have time for that? If you're fast. Bridge and have hold position. Come wide, please. So this is a sponge in the family Corbitellini. It's going to be a soft sponge. Can I put this in the forward box? Yeah, you can put it with the uh, Sea Star uh, forward starboard. Okay, great. Forward starboard. Your starboard back, beta. Be right. Wait, forward starboard? Yeah. No, put it in forward bio box. Bio box B. Forward bio box, starboard side. Yes. Let me start that again. Uh, we used to have them called different things instead of A and B. And someone changed that on me. It was way less confusing when we didn't have two Bs. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to put it in the front of the vehicle. The front. Yeah. The front. I'm going to put it on the, the, right, the side right side of the front of the vehicle. <laughs> yes, that sounds perfect. It used to be Lambda and Omega for the two forward boxes. That was so much less confusing. Do you want me to back the ship up? Um, I'll just be really fast. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can, can just you get a little box, chunk. I don't oh, need just much. a chunk? Yeah, just a chunk. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't think we need the whole thing. Oh my gosh, are you sure? You can come sure? up on Delta. You can come up like eight meters. Yeah, that's You're perfect. Really, really laid back. Roger. Extend the box out, please. Okay, box closed, please. Oh, gosh. That was 084. Roger, 084. 100% up. Awesome. Thank you. And you can come up pretty fast, too. Can I call it sponge under duress? Oh yeah, we're already outside the 20 ring. We'll be all right. Ooh. Sorry for scaring you. <laughs> what did you get for your quiz? Uh, it said I am a deep sea scientist. <laughs> Can I get a bubble on the craft, Good please? Good job. <laughs> okay, now take it, it again. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll go take it again and uh, choose other choose answers. Your, yeah, second answers. One more time. Did you know, did you have, were, you were looked at all of the answers and you're like, yeah, it's just one. Oh, no, there were definitely oh, yeah, multiples that. that I would, I would choose. Thanks. I like quizzes when you can choose multiple answers. Mm -hmm. and then yeah, I yeah, I definitely choose a lot of these. Um, 
like I hope my career will help me share ideas with new people, make discoveries, like travel places, like uh, all of the above. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think I did. I think I did it twice, and it was a uh, seafloor mapper or a video engineer. Everyone wants to be the video engineer. I see. Yes, I'm just not as cool. You're cool, Coralie. You've got a whole fan club in the chat. But, you know, you said not as cool. And yeah, Aaron is quite cool. It's true. <laughs> I just said the video engineer position. I didn't say me. I said everyone <laughs> wants to be in this position. It's just, it's a given. You are the quiz, video engineer. The Most tell right. Do you tolerate air conditioning? Is data engineer. <laughs> video engineer. Do you bring him? <laughs> Which uh, sometimes I manage lots of data, so I guess that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have some ship live questions on that topic. Is there <laughs> anything people are forbidden by tradition not to bring on a, a, a forbidden to bring on a cruise? Like oh, alcohol. I think, yeah, we're definitely forbidden to bring alcohol. Like probably. But I don't think weapons. that's tradition. That's just sort of. No, that's that's practical. I think <laughs> it, I think they're trying to get us to say things like bananas. Yep. Um, What's that? It's like the superstition it's about bananas bring, bringing them on ships is bad luck. It's because they used to have the big banana ships and people would die on the ships and it was because of spider bites. <gasps> oh, but they thought it was because the, the they, bananas just became a sign for bad luck because uh, they didn't know what was killing people. And okay. it was spiders that were in the bananas. Oh, Do you allow no bananas idea. on your boat? But not banana spiders, because those are different. No. I'm so superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, like, crazy. just in case. Yeah, totally. I almost brought a banana on board, too. Good well, thing I ate it. People, no, I, pe I, this is not my boat. People here can bring whatever they want, but my own boat. Right, that banana would have lasted like a day in Hawaii, so. <laughs> yeah, bananas don't last I'm pretty that sure that was the whole, the whole thing. Was I've also heard rumors that it was because the bananas rotted the other fruit. Or something. So if you brought bananas, your other food lasted less long, or something. I don't know. That's very practical, though. Like that's yeah, that is bananas true. produce a lot of ethylene, which is what makes other fruits ripen faster. Yeah. Right. right. Whenever I get avocados, I put them near my bananas mm -hmm. to make them speed up a little bit. Other um. things you're not allowed to bring on board: uh, cats. Right. I wish I could bring my cats. Well, I don't know if they would cats. enjoy it though. Are you just like not allowed to, or no, no cats allowed? Disease spread or no? Just because it's a pet, I could have said no pets, but I wanted to be specific about cats. <laughs> <laughs> I think cats would be a little more stable than dogs. I think dogs have a tendency to be a little more slidey and like, oh my gosh, where am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah cats have probably. a little better balance. Yeah, they they might do better on a ship. Uh, do we have access to laundry machines? How do you pack for an expedition like this? Yeah, we have access to laundry machines. Uh, la la large vessels uh, have a team that will actually do your laundry for you and hand it back all nice and folded, which is awesome. You like Where's the Falcor? At? Yeah, like the Falcor. Not Falcor 2, though. Just Falcor regular. Falcor 2, probably. I don't know. I haven't been on it yet. Um, but yeah, uh, how do you pack? Well, if you live right near the port like Megan does, you just bring whatever you can fit in your room. Just rubbing it in. You're like, I'm so jealous. <laughs> I'm still so jealous. Yeah, uh, she like came on board and was like, oh, I want to bring this, this, and this. Like, let me go home and go get it. Yes. She asked me, like, did you leave anything? We can run to the store. Like, no, I had, I had to fly here. So I had a backpack and a duffel but like fit the regulations because we can't check bags because they could get lost and then we'd be at sea with no clothes i take the risk zoom in you please. took the risk yep yeah adam checked his bag and i was like why would you check your bag like what happens if the plane crashes like how are you going to get your bag wait what? wait <laughs> that's not the that's that's not the reason <laughs> <laughs> if the plane crashes <laughs> you've got more problems <laughs> Well, okay, I think it was like, I was like, aren't you worried about losing your bag? And he was like, I'll just buy new clothes. Thanks. And then um, he was like, why would you want to check your bag? Or why would you want to carry your bag on? And I was like, if the plane crashes, I want to know where my bag is so I can get it. That is not the reason why we don't check our bag. <laughs> and now you're not allowed to. <laughs> you can't do that. Let's talk later. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think. 
Yes, let's talk later about this. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have some plain discussions. Well, that sponge that we were looking at was a sack of calyx, just so you know. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for being responsible for us. I was like, I want to talk about the sponge. I love talking about sponges. Uh, so yeah, clothes, uh, maybe some snacks, maybe some boats are like, yeah, we don't have space for your snacks. Just bring some clothes. So it depends. Yeah, but if you, if you do have like food allergies, it's always good to bring a snack that you know is safe to eat. I just don't snack. Here. My, my sad li Actually, that's not true. I did bring snacks for the plane, which was wise because they did not serve food that I could eat. Um, so yeah, I did bring some snacks, but they are all gone now, except I think I have like one jerky stick left or something. You're gonna have to get snacks for the plane ride back. No, I'll just suffer. I have my jerky stick, I'm good. What? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Ooh, are there viruses in the deep sea? I don't know if they're meaning like viruses like like a, a specific species of corn can get, uh, like a virus, like a blight, or what? The question is, are there viruses in the deep sea? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Viruses are definitely in the deep sea. Bacteria, definitely in the deep sea. Um, I could Google what the concentration of viruses and uh, bacteria are in seawater. It's it's a bit more than what you might expect. I used to have that fact memorized, but I can't remember it right now. I would like to point out that we just filled the tepid tub on deck today, and people were rolling around in the seawater and wondering <laughs> why I didn't get in it. It's because I, I mean, didn't bring sea gear. It's yeah. not because I was afraid of viruses. <laughs> <laughs> While you look that up, someone else got video engineer on the test, so indeed, everybody wants to be a cat. Because the cat's the only cat who knows where it's at. Um, okay, the estimated abundance of viruses in the ocean is between 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 11th uh, power viruses per milliliter. It's quite a lot. Yeah. No. Yeah. Don't be scared, though. The That's a lot of friend. zeros. Oh, I think I missed something. Uh, octopuses. Octopuses. I would love to say octopi, but apparently the correct plural is octopuses. Octopods? Or octopods, yeah. Octopodes. Um, are they, uh, do they display any of the same playful or inquisitive behaviors of their shallow or cousins in the deep sea? Um, well, they're, they're not nearly as uh, active as, say, the... Uh, shallow water octopuses. Um, usually we see them just sort of gliding about their business, uh, but they do sometimes react to the vehicle and might show us uh, some tentacle waves or um, some swimming activity. So, yeah. <laughs> but we don't see them very often. Uh, the one we did see during this dive was just a brief view. Um, probably just came by to figure out what we were doing. And I, I saw it in the Argus view just for a split second. I'm so sad that I missed that. Yeah, it was really cool. Nice. I mean, it, it wasn't like the best view, but uh, I was like, oh wait, is that an octopus? Awesome. I was chest deep in the chat over here. Got a very active chat today, which I am grateful for. Keep sending in your questions to nautiluslive.org, and we will answer them the best that we can, which sometimes takes us a long time to answer because we have so many things to say about things. So just hang in there. And we will usually get to your question eventually. Um, someone's comparing uh, space crews to running uh, ROV operations. Yes. Um, Sometimes underwater um, operations are studied and used as kind of like, I don't, don't want to say demos or practices, but they are um, compared to, uh, comparable to uh, space operations. Aaron, you got time for some I wake mapping? Up before you. What? Sorry. Were you, were you asking other Aaron? It was other Aaron. Oh, it's okay. I'm sorry. 
Or are you She's talking more to me? Interesting. <laughs> Erin, it's another question for you. Do you have time for a mapping chat? Absolutely. I'm just talking about grilled cheese up here. <laughs> Nothing important at all. Go ahead. Grilled cheese is important. Um, it will be in 18 minutes, that's for sure. Ooh, nice. Um, this person says, if I had known about seafloor mapping when I was studying GIS, my life would take have taken a different, a completely different direction. How uh, related are the two as far as, like, you know, you're taking GIS classes, what, like... Is it just a short hop over to seafloor mapping, or is it uh, a little bit more? Um, well, the, the GIS classes give you a really good geospatial understanding and start to understand things like projections and all that, which is very helpful. Um, but then you have to learn more about acoustics and positioning um, to understand seafloor mapping. Um, but you can learn quite a lot in the field if you can find field opportunities. Um, or take classes as well, but people kind of do a mix of both. So it's not, it's definitely a good start. And we have a, a mapping internship here, correct? That is true, yes, we have a map mapping internship. We had multiple interns out for our transit uh, from San Pedro to Hawaii. Uh, Very cool. We've had it for a couple of years, yeah, it's a good one. Video, Aaron. Is it okay if I ask you a question, or are you mad at me now? I wouldn't be mad at all. Oh. Of course, you can ask me a question. No, I mean mad at me per just personally for not choosing it before. Oh no, no, that's fine. You'd never be mad at a question asker. We love the question. No, I'm never mad at anyone. <laughs> <laughs> you are smiling almost all the time. Um, <laughs> how are cameras designed to function in the deep sea? Do you know? Yeah, so they're in a titanium housing. Um, and we're connected to them through a fiber. That's that tether you're seeing. And so, yeah, there's lots of different things that you have to do. Um, you have to think about heating, you have to think about air ventilation, everything. So, oh, and pressure, everything. Um, yeah, you can't just put a normal camera on Herc or Argus. So you're very cold right now because you are in front of a lot of machinery and computers that need to be kept cold. But we worry about heating the cameras underwater. Um, just just that's a camera thing in general. Um, these ones aren't going to get too hot because they're, I mean, quite deep. But when you put cameras into underwater housings, that's something just you have to think about is is how the camera systems will handle it. And yeah, are, are you more concerned with them getting too hot or too cold? Um, it depends, like, the situation. <laughs> that's Fair a, enough. Yeah. So, like, and I'm trying to think of, like, if you're thinking of, like, not deep-sea cameras, often they'll overheat okay. um, in the housings. So some of the newer cameras are having issues with that. Can you zoom in on this cube, please? Yeah, I can. All right, we've got a cucumber. A little so dusty. Yep, and I think it's collected a little bit of sediment. So this Thanks. is a type of cucumber um, called Onirophanta. It is in the uh, family Dematidae. We collected one of these on a previous dive. Yep, this person says they're learning to make video games, so their interests make them, uh, their quiz result was a data logger. Nice. That makes sense. Did Corley, Corley, did you not ever get data logger? Uh, no, I didn't. Let me try taking it again and see if I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> when you get to the question, do you like recording data? I think you should answer it differently. Okay. Just keep shaking the magic eight ball until it gives you the answer you want. Yeah. Try again later. Try again later. <laughs> Try again later. Uh, bio question. Are those spines on the cucumber defensive? What do cucumbers have to be worried about at, the, at this depth? What eats a cucumber? Um, well, those uh, well spine-like structures uh, are really soft. So they're not actually spiny at all. Uh, they're like an extension of the cucumber's skin pretty much. Um, they could be sensory in nature, um, using to feel around the environment and move. Um, they can move their 
their different little tendrils, um, kind of using them like feet. But yeah, no, uh, they they are not defensive, and nothing really eats cucumbers. Cucumbers are not delicious in the ocean. They're basically big sacks of water, right? Yeah, basically. So it, if you were to cut one of these open, it would just basically be water and then guts. And the guts are just full of sediment that it's been eating. So kind of a little crunchy. Um, the skin of the cucumber, uh, it has what are called ossicles. These are little um, carbonate hard parts. Uh, the name for sea cucumbers, holothuroidea, means spiny skin. And so in the skin of all sea cucumbers, you have these little spiny bits called ossicles. So even in the deep sea, you have, you know, this sort of kind of spiny skin, a little crunchy, probably not uh, top choice in your salad <laughs> condiments, you know? I don't know. I wouldn't go for it. That's just me personally. Same. Oh, here's an easy answer. What are some of your favorite deep sea critters to see? Oh, that's not an easy answer. Well, I mean, because there's so many there's answers. There's so many. There's too many. There. It's whatever one I'm looking at right now, like this Caliphagus. That's a, that's a really favorite one of mine. Uh, <laughs> I really like a lot of the sponges. Um, I like seeing the new things, so something I haven't seen before. So if you, if I had to pick favorite animal of the dive, uh, it's definitely going to be that spoon worm that we saw yeah. for attracting its proboscis down into its little hidey hole. That, that was awesome. That was something I had never seen before, so I'm still pretty excited about that. I like the little... Uh I'm, I'm going to get there. The little blind cusk, cusk eel. Yeah, the Typhlonus sneezes. Yeah, they're really cute, aren't they? They are. Um, what is the other sea cucumber looking thing that doesn't have spiny skin? Probably a sea cucumber, right? Yeah, I mean, all sea cucumbers have spiny skin, um, but they don't always have these little projections along their body. Some cucumbers look smooth. Um, but say uh, if you were diving in shallow water and you were to pick one up, your skin might feel rough or might catch on your skin a little bit because uh, depending on the type of sea cucumber, um, cucumbers have different shapes of ossicles in their skin. So some of them can be sort of anchor shaped, others are round, it, they vary in shape. And so similar to sponges, you can use the ossicles in the skin of the sea cucumber to identify uh, that cucumber. Cool. Okay, I took the quiz again and I got seafloor mapper. Wow. Nice. That's data E. Okay, let me try again again. <laughs> you, just, you could just get like, honestly, I would be happy with any of the jobs uh, here, so it'd be really easy to get every single one of them. I like how nobody has had the result ROV pilot. Oh. It'd be really weird to want to do this stuff. It'd be super weird. Um, speaking of the ROV, give you some love here. Um, are the cameras on Hurricane and Argus filled with any kind of fluid to help resist the pressure? Air. Air is a fluid. That's not the answer you expected, is it? <laughs> They're just filled with air. Not. ROVs actually took apart one recently. Yeah. Or three. Took or three. three. <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Grab one last question. We're going to be do, uh, starting um, watch rotation in just a second. Um, so while we do that, um, if there's no light at these depths, uh, do the eyes on the fish detect other forms of reflected energy, or are they just there to spot bioluminescence? Um, yeah, it's... Eyes usually only react to light. That's what describes an eye. So you, they're not like picking up on anything other than light. Uh, and the light that's down here is bioluminescence. Uh, but some 
fish have really reduced eyes or very primitive eyes uh, that look. So we might see a fish uh, laying on the seafloor called Ipnops. It has sort of a, a plate that can sense light but can't resolve.